ever feel like you're out there playing chess and the enemy's playing checkers, you've got your battle plan, you know the terrain inside and out, but then boom, first contact and everything just goes sideways. Yeah, that's the thing about execution, isn't it? It's where the rubber meets the road. And that's exactly why we're diving deep into ADP 50 chapter four today. It's not enough to just know the moves. Exactly. ADP 50 really drives home that point, yeah. execution. It's about understanding the why behind the what. You know, it's about having that framework that helps you adapt and really thrive in the chaos of the battlefield. And that why is so key because, like, Field Marshal Helmo von Moltke said, no plan of operations goes with any degree of certainty beyond the first contact with the hostile main force. Right, which basically means the moment those bullets start flying, right. your perfectly crafted plan might need a little adjustment. Yeah, you got to adapt. ADP 50 gets that. That's why it hammers home the importance of adaptability. You know, mm -hmm. giving commanders and soldiers the flexibility to adjust based on what's happening, like, right there in the heat of the moment. So think of it like this. You're pinned down. You're taking enemy fire. Your original plan to advance is completely off the table. Completely blown up. What do you do? This is where understanding adaptability, as ADP 50 outlines, is absolutely crucial to success. Absolutely. And that means, you know, being able to assess the situation, understand the commander's intent. Right and then make decisions on your feet to accomplish the mission. You gotta be able to recognize that, that initial plan. It's a guide, not an anchor. It reminds me of that classic Patton quote, one makes plans to fit circumstances and does not try to create circumstances to fit plans. Mm -hmm. Speaking of adapting to circumstances, that kind of leads us to our first major principle from chapter four, seizing and maintaining the initiative. You got it. Seizing the initiative is about becoming the chess player in that match, right? You're dictating the terms of engagement, keeping the enemy reacting to your moves instead of the other way around. Right. You're in control. Exactly. And ADP 50 calls this forcing multiple cross-domain dilemmas, which essentially means hitting them where it hurts from multiple angles and never letting up. You got it. Keep them off balance. <laughs> exactly. It's about keeping them off balance, forcing them to constantly respond to your actions instead of, you know, being able to execute their own plan. So imagine this. You're disrupting their communication lines with a cyber attack. And at the same time, you're flanking their position with ground forces. Oof, that's a one-two punch. Yeah. They're not going to recover from that. That's a cross-domain dilemma right there. Exactly. Just like Rommel said, the man who lies low and awaits developments usually comes off second best. Taking decisive action, creating those dilemmas, that's how you maintain control of the battlefield. But taking the initiative in this way also requires recognizing and creating opportunities, right? Yeah. And that's another crucial point highlighted in ADP 50. Absolutely. The document really emphasizes that opportunities are made, not just found. Right. It's not enough to simply react to what the enemy throws at you. You have to actively look for ways to exploit their weaknesses and create your own advantages. And speaking of exploiting weaknesses, one of the best historical examples we've got of this has to be Colonel Chamberlain at the Battle of Little Round Top. Oh, that's a textbook example right there. Yeah. Colonel Chamberlain's actions during that battle they perfectly illustrate what it means to recognize and seize an opportunity in the heat of the moment. He didn't hesitate when that new threat emerged on his flank. Instead, he rapidly reassessed the situation, adapted his plan, and ultimately secured a Union victory. Right. He saw that chance to exploit a gap in the enemy's line, and he went for it. And it changed the course of the battle. Talk about a real-life example of turning the tide of battle by taking the initiative. But of course, ADP 50 also cautions against confusing initiative with recklessness. It's about taking calculated risks, not throwing caution to the wind. Right. And ADP 50 actually provides a really helpful diagram, figure uh, 4 1. Okay. It outlines all these different risk reduction factors that commanders should consider. You know, things like having clear intelligence, understanding the enemy's capabilities, ensuring adequate combat power that helps you make those informed decisions rather than, you know, just blind gambles. Right. So how do we balance this need for calculated risk taking with the need to make like split second decisions under pressure? Well, that's where the RDSP comes in. OK. The rapid decision making and synchronization process outlined in Chapter four. It's a framework designed to help commanders and leaders make those critical decisions, you know, quickly and effectively, even in the fog of war. So let's break down this RDSP a bit. What are the actual steps involved? Because that's something I think a lot of soldiers listening might be wondering about. How do you actually put that into practice when you're out in the field? You're right. Understanding the steps is key. The RDSP 
it boils down to four main actions. Okay. First, you got to rapidly assess the situation. Mm -hmm. You're considering your mission, the enemy, the terrain. Right. Then you got to develop options, thinking through different courses of action to address the problem. Okay. So you've got your options. What's next? The third step is deciding on the best option. Right. Considering the risks and benefits of each one. Weighing those risks. Exactly. And finally, you got to synchronize your actions. Communicating the plan clearly and concisely to your team. Make sure everyone's on the same page. Right, because you could have the best plan in the world, but if you haven't communicated it effectively... It's worthless. Exactly. So it's about quickly making sense of all that chaos out there. Right. Considering your options, picking the best one, and then making sure that everyone knows what the heck is going on. And that sounds incredibly useful, especially in like a fluid, fast-paced environment like yeah. we're talking about. Oh, absolutely. It's designed to prevent analysis paralysis. Right. In those high-pressure situations where you don't have the luxury of waiting around for perfect information. You've got to make a judgment call. Sometimes you just got to trust your gut, you know. Right, yeah. Use your experience and make the best call with what you've got. And that might mean issuing a fray guard. Exactly. A fragmentary order, right. Right. If the situation calls for, like, speed over formality. Right. Sometimes a full-blown operation order, it's just not feasible. Right. You need to get those essential instructions out there quickly. Right. A fray guard lets you do that when focusing on those need-to-know elements for immediate action. So it's about that balance, right? Speed and clarity. You need to act fast, but you also have to make sure that everyone's on board with the plan. 100%. Especially when that plan might have just changed like that. Oh, absolutely. And a VP50 is big on ensuring that your subordinates, they understand not just what they're doing, right, but why they're doing it. That's where things like confirmation briefs and back briefs come in. Okay. Those quick gut checks to ensure that everyone is on the same page, even when things are moving a million miles an hour. It's like that old military saying, a good plan violently executed right now is better than a perfect plan next week. Man, that's the truth. But again, that speed, it can't come at the cost of shared understanding. Right. You got to bring people along with you. Even with a fragord or yeah. a quick verbal order, just confirming that everyone understands the intent behind it. Right. How it fits into the bigger picture. That's crucial. Because it's not enough to just react. It's about maintaining momentum, keeping the pressure on the enemy. So what exactly does building and maintaining momentum what does that look like in the context of execution? Think of it like this, right? Yeah. You've seized the initiative. You're dictating the tempo of the fight. Oh. Maintaining momentum is about sustaining that tempo, you know, yeah. keeping the enemy off balance so they're always a step behind. Right. Always reacting to you. Exactly. It's about those decisive shaping and sustaining operations executed at a pace the enemy just can't match. So it's like pushing on that gas pedal and just not letting up, right? That's it. Forcing the enemy to react to your actions, yeah. not being able to carry out their own plans. That's a good way to put it. And when you're able to maintain that tempo, yeah, that's when you really start to see those opportunities to exploit. Which brings us to kind of the next major guidepost in Chapter 4, exploiting success. Yeah. So what should commanders be considering when it comes to recognizing and then like capitalizing on those opportunities that inevitably pop up in the heat of battle? That's where a commander's judgment and intuition really become paramount. Mm. They need to be able to see beyond just a tactical win. Right. You know, to ask themselves, does this success, does this open a door to achieve something bigger? Something that aligns with the commander's intent and the overall strategic objectives of the mission. So it's not just about celebrating a victory, right? It's about looking at the chessboard, thinking several moves ahead. That's it. And how can this victory be leveraged for even greater gains down the line? Exactly. For example, like a successful flanking maneuver, that might not be the end goal in itself, right? Right. Maybe it allows you to cut off enemy supply lines. Right. Or to outmaneuver a larger force, yeah. ultimately having a much more significant impact on the overall operation. It's about the big picture. Exactly. But even with, like, the best tactical execution, the most brilliant exploitation of opportunities, things can fall apart without proper sustainment. Oh, 100%. Right. Chapter 4 makes it clear. Sustainment is the lifeblood of any operation. Keeps the lights on. You can have the most daring plan, the bravest soldiers. But if you run out of ammo, food, fuel... It all grinds to a halt. Think over. It's like that saying, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. Because without the logistics, the tactics, they don't matter. They mean nothing. And that's something that commanders need to be considering from the very beginning of the planning process 
all the way through execution. Right. From the start. Anticipating those potential logistical challenges and having systems in place to ensure a steady flow of supplies, equipment, support, all of it. So to kind of summarize, exploiting success, it's about recognizing those key moments when opportunity presents itself. Yes. Making sure that your actions align with the commander's intent. Yes. And having the logistical backbone to support your moves. You got, It's about seeing the big picture, thinking strategically, and making sure you have all your ducks in a row before making your move. Because successful exploitation, it's often a combination of careful planning, effective execution, and of course, a little bit of luck. It's amazing. You know, when you really think about it, there's so much that goes into successful execution. It's more than what we see, right? Oh, absolutely. It's about those really critical decisions that are being made at every level. It's about that seamless coordination between units, that constant flow of information, and then this continuous cycle of assessment and then reassessment. And what I think is really impressive is how ADP 5.0 does such a good job of highlighting everyone's role in that really complex process. Right. From the commander all the way down to each individual soldier. Right. It really emphasizes that everyone has skin in the game. You know, hmm. everyone plays a part in ensuring that the mission is a success. And speaking of roles, chapter four, it really emphasizes the commander's role during execution. What are some key takeaways there? The document really underscores that a commander's primary focus during execution, it should be on directing, assessing, and leading. They need to be constantly striving to understand that ever-changing situation, you know, and then constantly refining their visualization of the operation as it unfolds. Think of it like um, conducting an orchestra. Mm. The commander sets the tempo, guides the sections, but also listens and adjusts based on what they're hearing. Right. So it's not a sit back and watch kind of role. The commander has to be actively involved like throughout that entire process. 100%. Yeah. That means being present, you know, where they're needed most. Yeah. Sometimes that's at the command post, overseeing that broader operation, yeah. right? Other times it's forward, out there with a group, getting a firsthand view of the situation on the ground. It's about striking that balance between maintaining command and control while also providing that direct leadership. Right. So they have to kind of balance those two things. And the commander's not alone in this either, right? Because chapter four talks about the importance of the commander's team. Oh, for sure. The seconds in command, the command sergeant's major, the entire staff, everyone plays a part. That's right. The commander's team is essential. They provide that support, that advice, those different perspectives that are so valuable. Right. For instance, you've got your seconds in command, right? They act as those senior advisors overseeing specific warfighting functions, maybe even taking command of specific operations or elements, and that frees the commander up to focus on the bigger picture. Right. They can delegate some of that. Exactly. And then you've got the command sergeant major who's bringing, you know, years of experience and a deep, deep understanding of the needs and the morale of those soldiers that are, you know, out there on the ground. Absolutely. They're that vital link between the commander and the troops, making sure that the commander's intent is understood, yeah. and then also making sure that any concerns from the front lines, they get heard. They're not getting lost in the chain. Exactly. And let's not forget the staff, no. especially the current operations integration cell, the COIC. Right. So they're like the conductors of the operational orchestra. I love that analogy. That's a good one. Yeah, the COIC. They're the ones making sure everything is synchronized during execution. They're translating that commander's intent into action. They're allocating resources effectively. They're keeping everyone in the loop as that situation changes, which, let's be honest, is constantly. Yeah, and it's remarkable how much coordination and communication goes into making all of that happen smoothly, right? Yeah, it really is. And that's why ADP 5.0 just keeps hitting those points home Clear communication, shared understanding, and then, of course, that crucial ability to adapt to those changing circumstances. Because at its core, effective execution is about teamwork. It's about adaptability. It's about everyone being aligned on that commander's intent. So as we kind of wrap up our deep dive into ADP 5.0, Chapter 4, what are the most important things for our listeners to kind of keep in mind when it comes to, like, mastering this whole art of execution? First and foremost, you got to remember, Execution isn't linear. It's dynamic. It's fluid. It demands constant assessment, adaptation, and that clear communication we talked about. Don't be afraid to deviate from that initial plan when the situation calls for it. But always, always make sure those deviations, they align with the commander's intent and the overall strategic objectives of the mission. Right. So your commander's intent, those strategic objectives, that's your North Star. 
Exactly. And never, never underestimate the importance of teamwork, trust, and really understanding your specific role within that larger operation. It's about how you fit into that big picture. 100%. Because victory, it's rarely achieved by individuals. It takes a team effort. It takes a team, united in purpose, adapting to that ever-changing battlefield and never losing sight of that ultimate goal. And on that note, we've reached the end of our deep dive into the critical concepts of execution found in ADP 50, Chapter 4. We hope this exploration helps you navigate the complexities of the battlefield, adapt to the unexpected, and lead your teams effectively. Until next time, stay frosty.